Man, if you're new here this morning, my name is Adam, and man, I'm so thankful you've chosen to start off the year with us and worship with us this morning. If you do me a favor after service and come over here to Next Steps, uh, we'd love just to get some stuff in your hand and tell you all about the church. Uh, But today, I'm really excited because we are starting a brand new series to start off our year, and uh, man, I, I... believe and I know that God's going to do something amazing at the beginning of this year as we just give it to him. We're starting off with 21 days of prayer and fasting and I believe we're going to see breakthrough in this time that we live in at the beginning of the year as we give the beginning of it to him. Amen. And so uh, we're, we're in a series entitled Why Revival Waits. Why Revival Waits. And this is really Man, this is the heartbeat of what God really has placed inside of me. I mean, there's this, there's this desire and this yearning that I have just to see a move of God. Anyone else with me just want to see a move of God in your life? And so we're going to be talking about that for the next uh, three weeks. I've entitled my message this morning, Unrelenting Breakthrough Prayer. Unrelenting Breakthrough Prayer. I believe that, man, as we learn to have this unrelenting prayer, that we're going to see breakthrough. Amen? If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen and get my notes. Um, Also, if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, that's where we're going to be uh, at this morning. It'll take a little bit for us to get there, but you can go ahead and turn there, put a marker there, and we'll read that uh, shortly into the message. Uh, Let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Mm. Holy Spirit, we, <laughs> we're here for one reason, that's just you, God. Nothing else. Lord, we're not interested in just going through the motions and playing church. Lord, what we're interested in is this real, authentic relationship that you invite your people into. I pray that during this series, God, that, Lord, we would learn to develop that, God. That, Lord, we would see a personal revival, God, that would lead us, God, to corporate revival, Jesus. But it starts with us personally, Jesus. And so, Lord, would you teach us, God, how to pray? Just as your disciples asked, Lord, how do we pray? And you showed them how to pray, God. Would you teach us, Lord, how to pray, how to behold you, God, how to not have just a one-time visitation of your presence, God, but a habitation of your presence, Lord. Lord, that is what we are after, God. That is what we desire. God, just as David prayed, God, this one thing I ask and this will I seek, that I'll dwell in the house of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire you in your temple. God, that is our one desire. That is the one thing that we are after, God. And so we are here today, God, coming with a humble heart, knowing, Lord, that none of us have it together, God. I don't have it together, Lord. I am broken, God. But, Lord, would you take me and, God, would you use me, God? Would you use us, Jesus, as a congregation and a people, God, for such a time as this? We need you, Father. Holy Spirit, would you speak? We don't make room for you, but, God, we give you the room. Would you just say that, God, we give you the room? Come on, would you say that again? Lord, we give you the room. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Why revival waits? Waiting. I don't like waiting. Anybody else struggle with waiting like I do? I struggle with waiting. Especially when I'm waiting for something that I don't have to wait for. You know what I'm saying? Like you're in a line and it's a long line. Maybe you're at the theme park or something like that. And you realize the line in which you were in was the wrong line the entire time. There is nothing more frustrating than that, is there? Or maybe you're at a restaurant it's really busy and you put your name in. And then the next thing you know is you're wondering why is it taking so long? It's because you've missed the text that they sent you and you've missed the table altogether and you waited for something and you didn't have to wait for it any longer. I don't fish very often, but when I do fish, it inevitably happens, y'all. I'll put my bait on the end of my hook and I'll cast it out. The next thing I know is I'm 
thinking to myself, why am I not catching anything? Anybody ever been there before when you fish? That's probably why I don't fish very much. Why am I not catching anything? And I begin to reel it in, and all of a sudden I realize there is no bait on the hook anymore. It is so frustrating. Why am I waiting for something I don't have to wait for? You know, the Christian life is full of waiting. The Christian life is full of waiting. But what I believe is that we're not waiting for God to bring revival. I believe he's waiting for us. We're not waiting for God to bring a move of his spirit, a move of God. He's really just waiting for his people. I believe the winds of revival are already available. I believe the fire that's needed for revival is already available. I believe everything that we need is already available for a move of God in our generation and within us. It's already there. God's just waiting for us. We're not waiting for him. There has to become this moment of transformation. The same moment that Jacob had in Genesis 28, where he says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. You see, Jacob, he had this moment where he said, okay, God is in this place. I sense it and I know it, but he's already been here. He's already been here. It's this transformational moment that we must all go through of not knowing God is there and he's available to knowing it. I believe that we've been waiting far too long for a move of God, but it's time for us to step up to the plate and to take a hold of what God has called us to take a hold of. Amen? Let me give you a definition for revival. Revival is just simply this. It's simply the awareness of the manifest presence of God. So it's coming to a point of you're just aware of his manifest presence. Someone uh, told me about this quote this past week. It's by Leonard Ravenhill, and I love it. Um, and actually, one of his books was inspired by this series. It's a really challenging book. It's called Why Revival Tarries. And he says this. He says, the only reason we don't see revival is because we are willing to live without it. The only reason we don't see revival is because we are willing to live without it. Here's the thing about a move of God in our lives personally and corporately. Is when it comes to a move of God and revival, it's going to cost us something. There's a price tag associated with it. It's not easy, it's not convenient. We can't fit revival in our own little box. We're thinking to ourselves, okay, maybe it's going to look like this. Maybe it's going to look like this. I'm here to tell you I believe that the move of God is going to look completely different than what I think it's going to look like. We can't put God in this box, expect him to move a certain way. We can't manufacture it. We can't hype ourselves up for it. It has to come from this desire in our hearts just to know Jesus. It's not this chasing after miracles, y'all. It's just chasing after the one who is the miracle-making God. It is keeping our eyes and our attention, our focus on him and him alone, and that's it. It's grabbing hold of the Lord and saying, I'm not letting go. I just want you, Jesus. I have to have you. I have to have this relationship with you. That's what it is. I'm reminded of Matthew 11, 12. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I love how the Passion Translation says it. I know the Passion Translation is more of a commentary. That's how I use it, but I want to read this to you. I love how it, how it says it. The realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth. The realm of heaven's kingdom is bursting forth. How many know that the heaven, that heaven is on the move, that God is on the move? And passionate people have taken hold of its power. I love that. And passionate people have taken hold of his power. Have you taken hold of the power of God that he has given you? You have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. You have all that you need. Have you taken hold of his power? So how do we see revival? How do we see this move of God? Now, sustainable revival doesn't come, it doesn't just happen. It's birthed, it's built, and it's sustained through prayer and spiritual pursuit. 
We must continually pursue a move of God in us personally, in corporately, and in our families. And in this pursuit, we must never give up. We must never lose heart. We must be steadfast in our resolve. Amen? So how is revival going to happen? It's going to happen little by little, church. Little by little. Everyone wants it to happen in this one highlight moment when God is saying, be faithful with the little. It's step by step. It's continually moving forward. It's getting marriage counseling. It's being in the word one day and then the next day and then the next day. It's being obedient with the tithe. It's serving and being faithful with the little. It's praying in the secret place every day. It's little by little by little. And then the little turns into a lot. Do you see that? The little turns into the lot. It's being faithful in the little things. So we're entering this season of corporate fasting and prayer. For the next 21 days, we're entering this season of corporate fasting and prayer. And fasting, like nothing else, brings us towards the heart of God. I don't want to have been in season of fasting, y'all. It's like when I get before the Lord, it's just like all of a sudden, just, I just start crying and tears start coming out because I'm just, I may sound weird to you, but I'm just, I'm more sensitive to the manifest presence of God in my life. It awakens me to it. Let me just say a little bit about fasting. Fasting is not a diet. <laughs> if you're just sustaining from food or something else, but then you're not praying, all you're doing is dieting. So you take that time in which you are fasting that you would be eating, and you go and you spend time with the Lord. You spend time with him. Throughout the Bible, it talks about fasting. Jesus fasted. Moses fasted. There's so many different people who fasted. Daniel fasted. Fasting is a biblical principle. It is something that we should be doing regularly. And what I love about this, too, is that we're starting off the year by fasting. And there's something about beginnings. In the beginning, was the word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's something about starting off the year by fasting and giving it fully and completely to the Lord. I've kind of said this, that, you know, my year does not start until February because my year is starting off with giving it to the Lord and then I'm expecting for the remainder of the year. I'm starting off by giving this first month to God and then he has the rest of it. You see what I'm saying? There's something about first, giving of your first fruit. Giving of the tithe. There's something about first. There's something about being alone with the Lord in the morning and giving that time with him, that first hour or so, just being with Jesus. There's something about first. And so we're starting off the year by giving him this first month, and we're just saying, Lord, just, just take it. Use me. Work on me, God. Do something inside of me. Lord, I just want to know you. This is a desire just to see breakthrough in your life, breakthrough in, in others' lives. And so I'm just reminded when I think of this, of this very popular uh, scripture and uh, it's Second Chronicles 7.14. Many of you know it. It says, if my people who are called by my name. How many of you are called by the name of Jesus? How many of your sons and daughters of God? If my people are called by my name will humble themselves. Fasting like nothing else will humble you before the Lord. It's the same to God. Lord, I know that I am nothing without you. Lord, I'm coming before you, and Lord, I, I know I've got nothing to give, but Lord, just all of me, he says, lay down your lives a living sacrifice before me. And so what we're doing in this moment is saying, Lord, I, I worship you. I'm laying down my life right now. Lord, I, I, I'm humbling myself before you. There's something about humility and fasting. Fasting brings humility. So if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. And what? And seek my face. I'm reminded of David in Psalm 27, 8. God apparently asked him this question. David, will you seek my face? And David's response is, Lord, with my heart, God, yes, I will seek your face. I'm going to seek your face. How many of you are just going to seek the face of the Lord for the next 21 days? Come on, someone. We're going to seek the face of God. I just pray right now, God, over every single person that, Lord, that we would seek your face. That, God, even those moments where, God, we don't feel like it, even those moments where our flesh is getting the best of us, God, I pray that, God, that, Lord, we would 
turn from our flesh and we would turn God towards you. Lord, I know that, God, you will fill us up as we seek your face. Because, Lord, you said about your people, God, as we draw near to you, you were drawn near to us. So I pray for every single person in this room, God, right now, Father, Lord, as we set aside this time to seek your face, God, that, Lord, we would develop this authentic, real, deeper understanding of you and this relationship with you that you're inviting us into. In Jesus' name. So if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. There's a turning from sin. We, we serve a holy God. And, and sin has, has no place when you really want to be before a holy God. And so, man, I'm thankful that God forgives us of our sins. I'm thankful that we can come. We can boldly approach our, his throne even though we've messed up because we all messed up. But there's something about turning from sin and just turning towards God. And look at the promises we do this. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Man, how many of you know that we need healing in our land? We need healing in our land. And I've heard Pastor Jim say this, man, this is an election year. And no doubt about it, it might look in the natural this next year crazy out there. But what I'm here to tell you is that, man, God is our hope and he can heal our land. But it takes a people who are setting themselves aside and saying, Lord, I'm going to humble myself before you. I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to pray. I'm going to turn from my sin and I'm going to turn towards you. That sin would not satisfy us any longer, but only the longing of our heart would be Jesus and Jesus alone. So I want to look now to Luke chapter 18. You might have turned there in your Bible already. Luke chapter 18, let's just go ahead and dive into this. This is an uh, unrelenting prayer, this widow who has this unrelenting prayer. It says this in verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Tell your neighbor right now, don't lose heart. Right off the bat, Luke gives the reason for Jesus telling the story to his disciples. It's in order to empower us to an unrelenting prayer. It's very clear that Jesus wants you to pray and never give up. Now, here's the thing about this is, especially in end times, we live, I believe, in the end times. And this passage is referring back, especially because of the end times, because look at verse 8. We're going to skip down this a little bit. It says this, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Jesus is saying that this parable is actually pointing to the end of the age and is more relevant to us today than any other time in history. And this is what comes to mind when I think of this. There, in the last days, there's going to be in 2 Peter, Peter talks about a scoffing spirit. A scoffing spirit which will come against people who are anticipating the Lord. And the scoffing spirit will say, why are you waiting for his return? Don't you know that he's been talked about for 2,000 years? Where is he at? The scoffing spirit saying, hey, why are you praying? It doesn't matter. The scoffing spirit, when you go to the place of prayer, when you go into the secret place, that will try to come against you and try to speak to you and say, God's not listening to what you're saying. Why are you praying? Why are you believing like that? The scoffing spirit, you have to know, will come against you. And you have to recognize it and see for what it is. You have to begin to say, I reject that scoffing spirit that's coming against me that Peter talks about in 2 Peter. And I'm going to realize that prayer matters. Listen, prayer works. God listens to his people. God listens to us. He is faithful and just. He is good. He's a good God who listens to our prayer. We serve a God who answers prayer. Jesus answers prayer, he fulfills his promises, and he wants us to pray and to not stop. The whole point of prayer is this, is to grab hold of God and just not let go. Bishop, he's taught me this, he says, he's told me over and over again, he's like, prayer is labor. It's work, it's labor, it's work. It's labor, it's work. In other words, you get before the Lord and you don't move until you've encountered him. Sometimes it takes 15 minutes. Sometimes it takes 30 minutes. Sometimes it'll take an hour. Sometimes it might take two hours. Prayer's labor. So maybe some of you are challenging in this room. Maybe you've never began to even pray before. 
and just, man, just give God five minutes. Just start there, give God five minutes. Maybe for some of you, you've had a faithful prayer life and you've set aside, you know, 10, 15 minutes a day to pray. Maybe God's going to challenge you during this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Maybe you're going to give more time than just 15, 20 minutes. You're going to give 30 minutes, maybe an hour. Prayer's labor, but you got to start somewhere. So I challenge you, wherever you're at, man, if, if you never prayed before, don't start off by saying, I'm going to pray for an hour. Just start off with just five minutes, 10 minutes. Start off somewhere. Just continually grow in that. It's labor, it's work. Look at verse two now. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. Can we read that together? That prayer that she prays? Get justice for me from my adversary. Can we do that again a little louder now? Get justice for me from my adversary. Now this is a widow and she's dealing with this judge who's an evil man. And so when you think of widow, a widow, you think of someone who has lost someone. You think of, of grief. You think of, of mourning. And so this widow is in a vulnerable state. And this evil judge is thinking to himself, I can take advantage of her. I can use her. I can take advantage of the situation. But then she gets in front of him and she says, get justice for me from my adversary. She prays this very incredibly powerful prayer that I believe is overlooked. That's one of the most powerful prayers in scripture. Get justice from me from my adversary. You've got to know this. You've got to know that you have an adversary. You've got to know that there's someone out there, his name is Satan, who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy you. Because he hates God, and his way to get to God is to come against you. You've got an adversary out there who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy, trying to take you out. And so what do we do? We get before the Lord and we, I mean, we pray. There's a, there's a hedge of protection that's available to the, peop, to the people of God. And we can pray for that, Lord, would you put a hedge of protection around me, around my family. And when you do that, you have this unrelenting prayer, this prayer that gets before the Lord. Lord, get justice for me, from my adversary. Something happens in the spirit. And when you decide to stand before God and lift up this unrelenting prayer, the adversary will do everything he can in his power to stop you from praying that prayer. Why? James 5, 16 says this, confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. I love this next part. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual, fervent prayer, church, of a righteous man availeth much. Because when you stand at the throne of God and you lift up your cry to your God, you say, God, get justice for me, for my adversary, when you never relent, when you were never moved, but you lift up your prayer, when you lift up your cry, your adversary knows if you'll just stand there and lift up your prayer, one of these days something is going to happen. So your adversary will do everything in his power to get you to be quiet. He's saying, whatever you do, God's saying to you, whatever you do, never give up. Never shut up. Never be silent. Lift up your prayer. You want to be a history maker, church? Be a prayer warrior. You want to make a difference for the kingdom of God? Learn to pray. Would you learn to pray? Would you learn to have this unrelenting prayer? Be a prayer warrior that has never moved. You're going to never be silent. But you're going to lift up your prayer to your God. And so she's saying to this judge, I don't just want you to get him off my back. I want this adversary to pay. Look at this next verse. Verse 4. And he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. So this judge, again, is his evil Terrible, awful man. And this widow continually comes before him and is asking, get justice for me from my adversary. Get justice for me from my adversary. And she's unrelenting. She's not giving up. Get justice for me from my adversary. And he is so annoyed that finally, which is an annoyance, he grants her request. Now this judge is being compared to God our Father. And you've got to know this about God our Father. 
He's not annoyed by you. He's not annoyed when you pray. He's not annoyed when you come before him. Look at actually what it says in Proverbs. It says, the prayer of the upright is his delight. It's his delight. He loves it when you pray. He loves it when you pray. He loves it when you come before his throne and you pray and you intercede. He's a good father who loves you, who listens to your prayers. Verse 6 says this, then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? This is a rhetorical question. And Jesus is saying in this parable, shall God not avenge his precious, his beloved, his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Again, it's a rhetorical question because obviously the answer is what? It's yes. God shall avenge, avenge his people who cry out to him day and night. Now, we come to a controversial part of this parable that Jesus is telling. The reason why it's controversial is because of here in verse seven it says, he bears long with them. But then right after that, it says, he answers them speedily. So let's look at verse seven and we kind of work through this a little bit. Verse seven, again, it says, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Here's the thing about it, why does God wait to answer prayer sometimes? Because he wants to use prayer in the spiritual pursuit of him to shape you. Because the more you're with someone, the more you become like him. He uses the effectual, fervent prayer to bring about his kingdom. Not for your life to be easy, it's not an easy button, but for your life to be meaningful for his kingdom. In other words, he wants to use prayer to form in you into his image so you can step into the destiny in which God has called you into. If he just answered you without the process of prayer, there would be no personal growth. So he waits with you until you're ready to receive the answer. And sometimes what he'll do is he'll put you in the fire and he's put you in a place. He's allowed some things to happen in your life. You're like, Lord, why is this happening? God, I don't really understand right now. I don't want to be here. Can you just move me past this season of difficulty, this season of hardship? But he's using that season to form something within you and he allows you to walk through it. But I'm here to tell you this morning while you're walking through that fire, God is with you and he's teaching you something. Now look at this next part, this next prayer, this prayer here. Get justice for me from my adversary. Again, this might be actually one of the most powerful prayers in all of scripture. Because when you're praying for justice, it requires two things. It requires two things. The first thing it requires is this. Justice requires restoration. Justice requires restoration. Restoration is this. Restoration is restoring that which was lost. So what was taken from you must be restored to you in its original condition. However, the enemy has ripped you off and now God has bared long with you. It's taken a while to get this answer of prayer. Justice requires not just simply restoration, but the second thing justice requires is this. Justice requires paying back punitive damages. Punitive damages is this. Uh, if you've watched a lot of lawyer shows, you might know. Punitive damages are the payment that a defendant found guilty of committing a wrong is ordered to pay on top of restoring what was taken or lost. So not only were you without that thing, you were without it for a long time. And if you're to have justice, justice demands not simply restoration, but payback for over and above. Not just simply when you pray this prayer, get justice for me from my adversary, and you're asking God, and you're coming before him, you're unrelentingly praying this prayer, eventually what's going to happen is God's not only going to give you restoration, but he's going to restore what was lost and give it back to you, and then some. And then some, come on someone, and then some. Let me give you an example. 
Justice says you've got to restore Joseph's freedom. He's been in a prison for 10 years. He's been locked up in this Egyptian prison. Not only are you going to restore him, but you're also going to put him in a palace. Restoration says you've got to restore Job, his health. You've got to give him 10 more kids. He's lost everything. He's gone through this trial. But repaying him back over and above says not only that, but you've got to double his wealth. And there has to be the spiritual inheritance that's given to him for generations to come. And the best part about it, when you read the story of Job, is found in chapter 42, verse 5, and it says this, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes sees you. Listen, Job's relationship with the Lord goes into a completely different level. That's the best thing about it. It goes to a completely different level. I can continue with more examples, but look at Proverbs 6.30. Men do not despise a thief if he still to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house, whatever the thief steals. I'm sorry. He shall give all the substance of his house. Listen, the thief, Satan, he has to repay sevenfold. But it comes from a place of getting before the Lord, having this unrelenting prayer to God, and just continually being before God. Because he answers the prayer of the righteous man. Uh, Our prayers are heard by the Lord. He cares about every single detail of our life. He knows even when the sparrow falls. And as we come before the Lord and we pray and we learn to, to pray and not to give up, there's something that happens where he's forming us and shaping us in this image. And sometimes, I, I agree, it's hard to wait. But, man, he's doing something in the waiting. This is what I believe this year is God wants to release a grace on your life to loose the captive free and to plunder the house of the adversary because justice demands it. Justice demands it. And when justice demands it, look at what happens next in verse 8. Worship team, you can come on out. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, Adam. I thought you just said he bears long with them. And now it says he avenges him speedily. We've just jumped into the the paradox of this passage here. He might take forever, it seems like to us. His time's different than our time. It might seem like it's taking forever. But when he gets justice for you from your adversary, fasten your seatbelt, you're in for a ride because it comes quickly. When he says he's giving you justice from your adversary, fasten your seatbelt because it's coming quickly. We have to recognize and know that when we pray this very powerful prayer, that God is going to do something as we come to before him and we unrelentingly pray. We've got to understand, man, as we, it's not just a one-time prayer, it's a continual thing. But coming before the Lord, having this continual pursuit after him, Lord, I just want to be with you. Lord, I just have to have you. God, would you bring me breakthrough? Lord, would you get justice from me from my adversary? Would you get justice from me, from my adversary? Would you rise to your feet right now? This is what I believe. I believe that this past year, this is what I felt like the Lord has impressed on my heart. I felt like he impressed on my heart that some of you in this room, you lost some stuff in 2023. Maybe you lost a friendship in 2023. Maybe in 2023, Your finances were impacted. Maybe in 2023, I don't know, maybe some health issues came about. But this is what I want to pray for us this morning is this. Lord, would you get justice from me from my adversary? Anyone with me this morning? The enemy has to repay, has to restore, and has to pay back and then some. So, Lord, we believe it and we know it, God, that, Lord, you are a God who answers prayer. And so, Lord, we declare justice, God. We declare justice from the enemy, God. Lord, what was stolen, what was taken in 2023, I pray, God, would be restored this next year.